Ashley Victoria Kohler was a 20-year-old from Riverside, California. She was a tomboy who loved cooking. Ashley's mother started noticing changes in her in May 2007, but seemingly had no reason to be concerned. She last saw Ashley in July 2009, and although a friend spoke to Ashley a month later, Ashley was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. I had something occur in my life recently. I discovered that something I thought to be very true for many years, something that I would have bet money on, turned out to be false. I found out the truth after the fact. I wish I could tell you more about it, but it involves a case that will eventually be covered on Unfound. And trust me, you'll get the whole story when we get to that point, but I can't do that right at this second. But as you've probably experienced as well, it's very strange to be so sure of something, then find out you weren't correct at all. It can change your worldview in an instant, especially if the topic is something very personal, as mine was. This is the situation we have in the disappearance of Ashley Kohler. And this episode is a good one for parents out there, especially ones who have daughters. Because today's is one where a mother raised her daughter the right way took the time to homeschool her, got her involved in activities and groups, gave her the direction that Ashley's birth mother couldn't provide. But it wasn't until after the fact that she discovered Ashley had been covering many things up, things that she never could have imagined Ashley doing, and she still doesn't have answers as to why it all happened. And now a summary of the case. Ashley graduated high school in Corona, California in May 2007. At this time, Ashley was dating a boy who seemed to have an effect on her self-image. She started acting and dressing very differently. With the culmination of this being frequent clashes with her mother, to the point that Ashley disappeared for a couple days while they were in Las Vegas to celebrate her 18th birthday. In response, in January 2008, Ashley moved out of her mother's home to live with friends, eventually finding her way to Arkansas where a family had lived a few years earlier. She stayed for several months with her friend Brittany, but kept in touch with her mother. Everything seemed to be fine. In August of 2008, after patching things up with her mother, Ashley moved back to California. She went to college in Riverside, but also started therapy to confront issues that had hurt her since childhood. In winter 2008, she got a job as a personal assistant to a woman who had an online business importing handbags from Europe and Asia. This was the perfect situation for Ashley in that it would allow her to go to school and work at the same time. She was even provided a place to live with the job. Yet, in the summer of 2009, Ashley's mother's ex-husband discovered distressing information on his laptop that Ashley had been using. She had been researching and talking to someone about becoming a call girl. When confronted with this information, Ashley admitted to the content on the laptop, but denied she'd ever do something like that. This would be the last time Ashley saw her mother. The last verified contact Ashley had with anyone was in August 2009, and that was a distressing short phone call with Brittany. Ashley's entire internet presence vanished by November 2009. Her disappearance remains unsolved. The interview for this episode is with Kim Brandy, Ashley's mother. Unfound News. There's a lot to talk about, but I'll be quick. Volume 1 of the Unfound Book Series will be coming out October 25th, in about five days. Coincidentally, my mother's birthday. It's an e-book for now, with printed editions to follow. Pre-order price is $1.99. Regular price, $2.99. Along with the six cases in that volume, you will find the surprise cover for Volume 2. The secret episode continues to get rave reviews on unfoundpodcast.com. Here is a quote from Twitter. Loved it. Completely different. Great to get your take, which makes so much sense. And all it takes to listen 
is submitting your email address. I did another Facebook Live show. You can count from now on that they'll take place on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll take questions regarding podcasting, writing, true crime, and maybe even some stuff about myself. I'll talk about that week's case and comment on recent missing persons news. I hope you'll take part in the experience. And to end the news section, Unfound picked up even more Patreon supporters over the past week. Shoutouts to Stephanie, Jeremiah, Sherry, Barb, Amy, Hannah, Carol, Lori, Amanda, and Nicole. I cannot thank them enough. Unfound also got a PayPal contribution from Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. The podcast now has a Nancy Drew level at $5 a month where you can read my in-depth analysis of the cases covered. I'll be trying to crank out a post every day until I work my way back to the beginning of Season 2 which is the disappearance of Kent Jacobs. I'd love for you to be a supporter. Where you can find Unfound on Twitter at Unfound Podcast. You can email the program unfoundpodcast at gmail.com on Instagram at Unfound Podcast. On YouTube, the Unfound Podcast channel. You'll find that once a Facebook Live show is done, it will play on YouTube later as a recording. On Facebook, the Unfound Podcast Discussion Group. Unfound also has a page now. Please like and share. I'm going to be using it for some ads and promotions for the program. You can subscribe to Unfound on Podomatic, Stitcher, Google Play, and iTunes. Unfound can also be found on TuneIn Radio. And please mention Unfound to all your friends and neighbors, along with spreading the word on Web Sleuths, Reddit, podcasts we listen to, true crime podcasts, and all other true crime websites and forums. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the mother of Ashley Kohler, Kim Brandy. Kim, welcome to Unfound. Hi. Tell the listeners a little bit about Ashley, um, about her as a baby, you raising her. Tell uh, the listeners a little bit about what they would have experienced had they met Ashley. Um, okay, well, Ashley was a very special little girl. She was, um, you know, she was just, she had such a beautiful soul. She was very loving and gentle and kind. She was always so helpful um, to me. And um, she would love to cook and be my little helper in the kitchen, especially around the holiday times. Ashley loved to bake. And um, she had this, uh, growing up, she had a special recipe um, that she would make over the holidays around Thanksgiving and Christmas as well. But she would make this like pumpkin bread and um Everybody loved it, and and she would make it as gifts, and uh, we'd take it out to all of our families. And she just had this such a generous spirit about her. Um, <clears throat> Ashley loved animals as well, and um, she was actually a very quiet person. She she loved to read, and um, she liked she loved to be around um, our family. And um, she loved her brothers and her brother and um, her baby brother. Uh, you know, Ashley was homeschooled up until high school. And um, the biggest reason we decided to homeschool Ashley was because she had um, a very traumatic beginning. And um, I'll just give you a little information about that. Um, so <clears throat> Ashley's father um, had a relationship with Ashley's mother, and it was during <clears throat> high school. They were very young, and her mother um, had Ashley in, moved to Las Vegas, and they didn't have a relationship as far as, like, they didn't stay together. Um they went their separate ways and I think it was, you know, a bad relationship, but, um, so we actually, uh, lived with her mom. Her mom struggled. She was a single mom. She 
uh, was actually arrested um, and uh, Ashley was taken away from her for a while. And that's when Ashley came to our family. Um, and, you know, I can just say that during this time, um, from the time she was born to about maybe three and a half uh, years, uh, she had um, a, a very difficult life. And so when she came to us, um, Ashley had a lot of um, emotional problems at the time. She would cry a lot, and um, she would have, like, night terrors. She would wake up and um, not know where she was and things like that. And so when it came time for Ashley to go to school, um, we decided that we would homeschool her and keep her home with us. And um, she did very well, actually. So uh, during the time that she was homeschooled, she was involved with um, many different clubs. You know, she played um, guitar. She was learning how to play the piano. She was in a science club. She loved the animals, like I said. She did... Um, you know, a lot of, she loved geology, she was in the Girl Scout, she was a venturer, um, you know, she she just, she had a great um, education, and um, we homeschooled her until she got to high school, and um, at that time, we um, had moved to Arkansas back to where her father uh, was from his family and um it's a very quiet small little town and uh I really felt you know Ashley wanted to go to high school and um and I felt that she you know would be be okay going to high school and so she entered into high school um there in in Arkansas uh you know growing up Ashley she she loved the outdoors and I think a lot of that is because she spent over 10 years um, in scouting. She was a Girl Scout. She was a venturer. And um, during those years, she did a lot of service projects. Like she would clean up the ocean. She would clean up hiking trails. Um, she would help big hiking trails. She, um, she would volunteer at retirement homes, and she would go and you know, bake goods around the holidays, and they, all the girls would bring the treats in. Um, for the staff and sing songs and go caroling from all the, you know, room to room to brighten up the days of the older people. And like I said, Ashley, she just was just a beautiful, loving person. Um, how, how did she like it in uh, Arkansas when you moved there? Did she make any friends there? She actually, um, you know, Ashley didn't have a lot of friends, but the friends she had, she held very close. And it was difficult for her to leave California because she had two friends that meant the world to her. And um, so that was a little difficult for Ashley. When she did get to Arkansas, she went into high school. So there were a lot of people there, and she was working. You know, she actually was a hard worker. She, she always had a job. And so... She um, had met another friend and became very close with her. Um, her name was Brittany. And um, another young man that was in one of her um, co-ed scouting troops, um, his name is Vinny. And those two people um, were, you know, very, very close with Ashley. And actually her friend Lisa ended up coming out to Arkansas and, you know, stayed with us for like a month or so during the summer. So that, that really made her happy. And did she graduate high school in uh, Arkansas or in California? Um, she, she entered into high school there and uh, we ended up moving back to California. And so she had done one year as a senior in um, in the high school in Corona, California. And did she graduate from there? That so that you're saying she had her senior year in Corona then? She did. She graduated um, 
in Corona, and um, it was in 2007. Okay. Um, now you, she obviously was a very busy girl involved in a lot of activities. Uh, you home, you homeschooled her. So you probably as a parent, um, saw her more than maybe a lot of parents saw their own children, just sending them directly to public schools, at least in the elementary levels. Um, but you did notice some changes, you know, maybe these were just natural changes, you know, getting to 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. Maybe you can tell the listeners a little bit about that, that, that you encountered. Well, like I said, you know, Ashley, she's actually a very conservative girl. And um, like she didn't wear makeup. Um, she loved the outdoors. So she, she didn't wear, um, you know, like tight clothes, things like that. She didn't wear high heels. And um, she, you know, when we came back here to California, um, when she was going to school, she met um, a boy um, named Carlo, and she started to go out with him. And um, during this time, I started to notice that she was uh, really changing like night and day. For example, you know, my daughter has um, like this really beautiful, uh, like a golden brown hair and big blue eyes. Um, and uh, she dyed her hair, she had black, and she started to wear heavy makeup. She started to dress, <clears throat> you know, wearing like fishnet tights and um, heels, just not at all, or Ashley, not at all. So it, it, I was concerned when she started to um, see this guy and how she was changing. Would you say to her, did she say anything? Have any discussions regarding that? Obviously you're worried. I'm sure maybe you had one conversation, but. You know, I think that, uh, of course, um, I did say to her that I didn't like the clothes that she was wearing. Um, Ashley was at this time, she was working um, part-time at Walmart. Um, as I guess a stock person. So she, you know, she earned her own money and she bought her own clothes and she was um, already 17. Um, I didn't like how she was carrying herself. And um, we had gone into an argument about it because she didn't like what I had to say. And for the very first time, you know, um, Ashley looked at me and, um, she told me, well, <clears throat> I'm going to move out. I'm going to move out with Carlo. I'm going to live with his family. And I, I said that, you know, you're not going anywhere. You're not 18 years old. You're not leaving this house. And um, for the very first time, she looked at me straight in my eyes and she said, well, there's nothing you can do about it because you're not my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, that was heartbreaking to me because although... <clears throat> I'm not a biological mother. I raised Ashley since she was just a little over four years old. And, um, you know, I just, it was shocking to me. She, she was always a good girl and she just never, never talked back. She never, you know, she just was, had such a pleasant personality and um, such a good heart. I was just really shocked that she would, look at me and just you know say that and knowing that it would hurt me so bad That's was it. this was this before or after she graduated high school it was after this is right before um okay. she this is right before high school graduation and she did pack her stuff and she left and um I did talk to the police and she was over 17 and a half and she was nearly 18 um, she had, uh, just like four months or so, uh, I'm sorry. So she, she had like another month before she would turn 18. And so they, the police were like, there's really not much I can do anyway. Sure. And so she went to live with, uh, is his name Carlo or Carlos? Carlo or Carlos? Carlo. 
Carlo. It's Carlo. All right, Carlo. Mm -hmm. And so she went to live with him. And did he live by himself? Did he have any other people that he lived with? Uh, parents, father, mother, or what kind of situation did uh, Ashley move into? Well, you know, I didn't. I didn't know him very well. He had come over a few times for dinner, and we did have a a really big graduation um, celebration for Ashley with our entire family there. Um, you know, there was probably like 30 people at the house, mm -hmm. and um, he attended that. Um, but that was really it. And that was actually um, towards, I think, more towards um, – a point where she she maybe started to see things that were not right, you know, with um, his family and stuff at that time. Did you keep in once she moved out, or uh, did you keep in contact with her? Was this like I'm not talking to you for a while, or did you main, maintain that communication after she moved out? And and how long uh, did she move out for? Do you remember? Um. She moved out and came back pretty quick. Pretty quick. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, good. Yeah. She moved out and she came back. Um, and I, you know, I think that uh, a lot of what was going on was before she moved out. And I think she was really angry with me because I didn't like how she was dressing and, and she just um, didn't like the control, you know, she just wanted to break free and, do whatever she wanted to do. And I was pretty strict with my kids. Um, so yeah, she, she did. And I tell you, um, you know, that was in May, um, 2007. And so when she graduated and, um, her birthday is late July. So within a couple of months, <clears throat> she had already been on the outs with Carlo and, um, and, um, you know, we went to um, a family trip to Las Vegas. And um, so she... Um, so you patch things up. I mean, I this, you know, these are things, I mean, I'm not a parent. Listeners should know that. You should know that. I'm not a parent. But I think what you're talking about is fairly common. You know, kids get to be 17, 18, and they have their own lives. And arguments happen. Things happen like that. Times. Right. No, we did definitely patch things up and, you know, we were planning to go for, um, to celebrate her birthday. My, <clears throat> at this time, my husband and I were divorced and, um, he still lived in Arkansas and I moved back to California. And so our youngest son, <clears throat> Joe, um, he would always go, uh, to the, for the summers. And so, the biggest reason I would go to Las Vegas is because I could fly him directly nonstop from there. If it, hmm. if he was flying from LA, he would always have a layover somewhere. And so I would just drive out there and get him on the plane there. And then his dad would get him on the other side. Um, but we decided this time that, you know, we were going to have, um, go and see a show and celebrate Ashley's birthday, her 18th birthday, um, in Las Vegas. And, um, she seemed to be at this time back to dressing like, you know, the Ashley that I raised and she wasn't wearing anything outrageous. And, you know, all the heavy makeup was gone. She seemed to like when Carlos was gone, she seemed to just come back to the way she, she was. And, um, so we went to Las Vegas and, um, she disappeared. She just took off. And um, wouldn't answer her phone. Just um, missed her own birthday celebration. And uh, it was pretty shocking that she would do that. Just took she off. It wasn't like she was. Grief. It wasn't like she said she was going somewhere and she was just poof, she was gone. When... Yeah. She mm -hmm. took off, um, you know, I had gone to the airport and 
um, all the kids, I, you know, three. And so we, we were there and, um, and she didn't go to the airport. And, and then when I got back to try to contact her back to the hotel, she wasn't answering and we were only there for the weekend. And, um, a couple of days, she just, she was gone. And she showed up back at our house. Um, apparently she got a ride back from somebody that she had met and, um, that was pretty much, um, I was so angry with her and, um, we had another really big argument and she took off and she went to Sacramento to go live with her friend, uh, Vinny. That you, that you'd mentioned before that he, he, she met him in Arkansas, but now he was in Northern California. Right. So Vinny mm-hmm. was part of um, the Venture Crew Troop, which is mm-hmm. a co-ed um, service troop through the Boy Scouts of America. And um, they were really great friends. He had, a, he had a, you know, nice family, you know, brought up really in the church, really good guy, really funny guy. And uh, he ended up, my family ended up moving to Sacramento. Um, and he would come out and visit us um, when we moved here to California. We, you know, we saw him. He came to visit a couple of times, and they always stayed in touch. So after that big blow up, uh, when she well, here, if if I might ask, what did she say happened in Las Vegas? So you're saying that you went she, back to California, and she got a ride back from Las Vegas back to L.A. She showed up at the house. She wasn't answering the phone oh, right. at the time, and I did, didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, when she finally, when I finally talked to her, she said that she was with a friend, and she wouldn't give me any details, and she said that she would just see me later. That was it. Do you, and, uh, okay, and we know, obviously, the, the reason you're on the program is because we know that a couple years later, she disappeared uh, for good, and maybe that in Las Vegas situation could have been the start of something possibly. Uh, but she obviously, you you said she, you and her had a another blow up, which perfectly understandable. I'm sure you you were losing your mind, you know, her being gone for those couple of days. She goes up to to uh, Sacramento to live with Vinny, but at some point she also went the whole way back to Arkansas. And and when did that yeah. happen? Um. During the time that she was with Vinny, but let me just back up for, sure. for a minute here. Um, okay. You know, I I had um, one time she had come in, she was asleep, and she snuck out of the house, and she came back, and this what she had told me was she went to go meet somebody, and then it comes out that she had been talking to somebody online, and I lost my mind. I said, you know... He, Okay, first of all, my daughter is like five foot two, and she was like 120 pounds. So she's not a big girl, and um, I'm, you know, it's after midnight, and so, you know, I was just livid that she would leave the house. Nobody knew where she was. She went to go meet somebody that she met online, and um, you know, I talked to her at length about the dangers of you don't know who you're talking to. You can't just go in the middle of the night and meet somebody, but. And it was shocking to me that she would do these things. Like, I just, you know, I couldn't believe that she was, like, brazen enough to go do that, you know? Mm-hmm. So, again, in Las Vegas, this is another thing that she had met somebody online, and she was going to, you know, uh, go meet with them. And I didn't, you know, we don't know these people. It's, when well, you have children you grow up you know they grow up and their friends are with them and you know them and you know they say oh hey mom I'm gonna go out with Brittany or you know you know Vinny and I are gonna go here you know who they're with um these people that she was meeting and talking to we had, I had no idea who these people were no and um so you know this was something about her that I just was shocking to me that she would just she had no fear. She would just go and do these things. Um, so she, like I said, you know, I, it was in August and, um, I was very angry and she was very angry. And so she went, she went to go, um, and live with Vinny for a while. 
um, during the time that she was with Vinny, um, she had always had a crush on Vinny. And, you know, he's a, a great person. And um, I understood why she did. And um, when she went up to Sacramento, Vinny was in a relationship at the time. And I think Ashley really wanted to see if they could be more than friends. And so she spent some time up there with him. But Vinny treated her as a friend, as she always had been. And, um, you know, she she left there not feeling very good. Oh, she was pretty much heartbroken when she left Sacramento. And she wasn't feeling good about herself. And, you know, she's very, you know, she felt very alone at the time. And how long was she and, up there um, before, how long was she up there? She was there until January. Uh, January of two, eight, January yeah. of 2008. Mm -hmm. And that's when she went to Arkansas. Right before she went to Arkansas, she found her mother. Um, and I believe she found her in Washington. So she and Vinny, she talked to Vinny into going with her to um, talk to her mother. And um, Vinny actually drove her there to Washington. And she decided that she would stay for a couple of weeks to try to, you know, work on and maybe repair that relationship with her mother and things didn't go well there at all. And, um, I, I don't know the whole story. Um, I know that, you know, the result, the end result was, um, that her mother dumped her off at, uh, I think a bus station from what I, from what I've uh, learned. And, um, so, you know, and that, I guess, um, I don't even know, I don't have words for how she must've felt at that time. I had no knowledge that she had gone to Washington to visit, um, Jenny. But, um, after that, she headed to Arkansas to live with her friend Brittany, and um, you know she was trying to get a new start. I guess you know she talked to me about that um, she wanted to join the Navy and she wanted to travel, and um, you know that that she'd be able to continue her education and. Um, she went to Arkansas, and her friend Brittany was on the same path. And um, I guess they both decided together they were going to do this together. And so they were, um, you know, working out and and um, making plans. And during this time, Brittany was still in high school. And so, um, you know, she, uh, Ashley spent a lot of time with uh, Brittany's mom, Cindy during this time. And how long uh, was Ashley in Arkansas with Brittany? Because she eventually did come back to California. I guess she changed her plans or what happened? And how long was she there? Yeah, she was there for quite a while. She was there for about um, eight months. So she was there from January to August. And, um, we talked on the phone, and everything seemed fine, you know, just just catching up and seemed like um, she was happy and she was excited that she was, you know, heading to um, kind of, you know, just turning over a new leaf and going to travel and everything. And um, she she ended up calling me. And telling me she was crying on the phone, and she said that she was sitting by the lake, and she was very sad, and she hadn't been feeling well, and she just wanted to jump into the lake, and so she did. 
And there happened to be a couple that came by and saw her and, um, and, um, I, you know, from what she told me, it may have been, uh, kind of an attempted suicide. Yeah. Um, when she called me and told me this, I immediately, um, purchased a ticket for her to come home the next day. And, um, I got her into therapy immediately because of the way she had been feeling. When she got back to California? Exactly. When she mm. came back to California, she went into therapy. And um, well, While she was in uh, Arkansas, did Brittany ever pass along to you any, anything? Any, I mean, I'm guessing that her telling you this was the first bad news you got from her while she was in Arkansas, but Brittany never passed along anything to you that, man, it really seems like Ashley is down or anything like that those entire eight months. Brittany um, had, you know, been over to our home many times. Um, and I, she never called me and had any, you know, to tell me that she was worried about Ashley. Um, it wasn't until Ashley went missing that um, Brittany told me a lot, a yeah. lot of things. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I ended up finding out, according to Brittany and her mother, Cindy, that when Ashley got to Arkansas, she was on drugs and she was trying to, she wanted to be clean. She was taking painkillers. Um, Brittany thinks it was Oxycontin and that she was highly addicted to it. Um, they said that, you know, when she got there, she was vomiting and going through withdrawals and very sick. Um, you know, my Ashley didn't do drugs. She didn't smoke. She didn't, you know, she, she didn't have any tattoos. She barely got her ears pierced when she was 15. You know, she's, it was pretty shocking to hear that she was addicted to drugs. Um, Additionally, um, Brittany told me that Ashley um, was extremely promiscuous when she was in um, Arkansas, that she would always want to go out, and uh, she was, you know, dressing a certain way, and she would go into the dance clubs, and her main goal was to find drugs. And so um, Brittany wasn't happy that Ashley was, uh, still, you know, she had come there and she was trying to clean up and she was going to go into the Navy, but she had relapsed and she was, um, you know, still, um, doing drugs. And, um, so she told me that Ashley had talked to her during this time and said, um, oh, you know, I think I'll be a stripper one day. You know, I think I'm really going to do that. And, um, you know, Brittany thought Ashley was joking. Didn't think that she really, really, you know, was thinking about becoming a stripper. Um, but you know, this is this seems to be her mindset, right? Um, uh, at this time, and she, and she she really one thing that Brittany told me was that Ashley really loved attention. And Ashley, my daughter, um, is very fit from all the outdoor hiking and body surfing and everything. And, um, you know, just a beautiful girl. You know, when she started to wear, um, you know, tight dresses and high heels, she got a lot of attention. And she really loved it. She was eating it up. Mm -hmm. Brittany told me that she would go... And she would go into the dance club and she would get up on like a little platform and she would dance and, um, you know, guys would just crowd around her and she, she absolutely loved it. But you didn't find all this out until Ashley disappeared in August of 2009. That was all, um, it was all unknown to you. Brittany never passed that along to you in 
any time in 2008 while Ashley was in Arkansas. You didn't find this stuff out until uh, afterwards. And we'll get into that maybe a little bit right. later. Um, but um, so what happens? You She comes back to California. You, of course, once again, you don't know about any of this, but you get her into therapy. And, and what happens when she gets back to California? Well, um, you know, she is going to therapy. She does get enrolled into Riverside Community College. And um, she seems to be okay. She actually starts working um, as a uh, graphic designer um, for a magazine. And, um, you know, she seems to be uh, heading on the right, you know, path again. Um, now, you know, mind you, I don't know about all this stuff. Sure, yeah. So all yes. I know is that we've had our problems. Most of it has been about, you know, her behavior, unsafe behavior, um, a choice of clothes and choice of boyfriends. And I guess that's normal, right? With mothers yeah. and daughters. Yes. Um, so, you know... In talking to her about, um, you know, what she tried to take her life, um, a lot of it had to do with the rejection from her mother and her not having a close relationship with her father. She just really felt unloved by these two people. And even though, um, you know, I raised her and um, her, she has two brothers, um, and I'm her stepmother. I like, you know, I've never um, treated her differently. I've never introduced myself as, you know, Ashley's stepmother. I've always been mom, always. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. She, I guess it's one of those things. Um, and I've heard a lot about this with with kids who. Um, are adopted um, or parents, you know, they don't know one of the parents, maybe the, you know, the father was never around. They just feel like there's a void and they feel like something's wrong with them. Um, and that's exactly how I actually felt like double whammy, like my mother and my own father don't really love me enough. And, you know, to be around, to stay with me, um, and so, you know, um, she's home, she's happy, she's in school. Um, she's going to her therapy. She doesn't miss any of the therapy yeah. sessions or anything like that? Right. No, she's, she's going there. Um, she, um, you know, everything, everything seems, you know, mm -hmm. seems good. Everything seems good. So, um, and then she gets a new job. Well, yes, yeah, she gets a new job. So yeah. during this time, um, Ashley was watching this one show on HBO. It was a series called Diary of a Call Girl. And um, I noticed that she just was, you know, obsessed with watching it. And she would watch the same episodes, and it was a series. She would binge watch it, and uh, you know, I just kind of thought that was just like oh, a little, a little strange. She was doing that. Um, she was in school, and so what she was trying to do was um, she was putting out flyers and um, and advertisement on. Um, I, be I believe it was Craigslist at the time. She was offering her services as a personal um, assistant. Basically, what she was offering is uh, during the holidays, she would babysit, she could clean a house, she could cook, she, she was, you know, just trying to earn extra money. Um, and, uh, yeah, so she, she actually, um, she finds a job as a personal assistant. She... She answers um, an ad on, on Craigslist for a personal assistant. And, um, yeah, so. 
and what was the what was the job? And this wasn't just a job. This was like a, a living situation too, right? This was a living situation. Yeah. Um, during this time, Ashley went to school in Riverside, and she met um, a person named Jason, and she started dating him. And um, you know, she wanted to live with Jason, and so she had moved out again. And um, she would come home and she would tell me that, you know, how she was feeling crummy again. And a lot of it was because of how he made her feel. He would put her down. Um, you know, I felt that he was, you know, emotionally abusive. And I I did not uh, like Jason. Um, and uh, so, you know, during the time... She met him, um, they broke up, and she was, um, she had come home, and about a week or two go by, short time, and um, she tells me that Jason's going to come pick her up, and they, she wants to go back and move in with him, and so this is like our third really big fight. I didn't want her to go. Um, I did not like this person. I mean, she was fine at home, you know. She was, she was, from what I could see, she was on a good path. And um, I was just really angry. I didn't, you know, didn't want her to go. Um, you know, one other thing, I guess, that um, was the tipping point was she between the two of us, um, she came home and told me that she had professional um, head shots done because she was considering modeling. And she definitely is a beautiful girl. So she shows me these photographs of her and um, they were borderline uh, pornographic. She was in lingerie, she was posed, you know, um, on the couch and um, very suggestive uh, positions and, you know, with her legs spread open and I lost it when I saw them. And I I told her, you know, that I, these were not headshots and I was just so angry and I was just like, what are you doing? You know, just yelling at her, like, what is going on with you? Um, so we got into a really big fight and, um, she, you know, during this time she wanted to go back with Jason and I think it's, you know, because she just didn't want to deal with me and she wanted to pursue whatever path she was on. And so, um, you know, she left and, um, and it wasn't good that time again. Did you ever find out where she got these pictures taken? Do you think that her boyfriend at the time, Jason, knew that she got these pictures taken? Now, I don't know um, if Jason knew. I, I don't. I, I do know that he was in a band, um, and this is all from Ashley. You know, he was in a band, and of course, there was like a lot of groupie girls, and um she felt like she had to really compete with them. And, um, and these girls were like throwing themselves at him and all the other band members and, you know, they would play at the clubs and stuff. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, Ashley really felt like she had to look a certain way. And, um, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. Whether mm. he knew she was having these photographs, mm. Uh, taken, um, but I can tell you that after Ashley went, went missing, um, we did track down um, who the photographer was, and um, we, we found the, the source from um, online. There's a, it's pretty old now, but it was a site called Model Mayhem, and um, and so through that site, she had posted up her. Uh, photographs and her bio and, you know, that's where people could go to get hired as a model. And so we were able to find, you know, the name of the person who be credited for the photo. So we weren't ever able to actually um, get in touch with that person. 
So that was kind of a dead end for us. Interesting. Okay. So you know she likes this this uh, TV show, Secret Di- Diary of a Call Girl, and then she comes home with these pictures. You know, you had to be worried. And yeah. then she gets a new job in the winter of 2008. Yes. What was the job? Yeah. What, did, what did she job tell you? In- what did she tell you yeah, about it? I mean, she was so happy about it, and it was actually ideal. She thought I would be happy because um, it, she wasn't going to live with Jason. Yeah. And, um, you know, she's like, yeah, you know, it's actually a live-in assistant, personal assistant, and um, I'm responsible for, um, it's like, sales and basically marketing and sales. And, I, you know, I said previously she – was creating, um, you know, she was doing some graphic uh, design work and she was um, working for a magazine. And so she had a little bit of that background. You know, she she briefly worked there, but she did have a little bit of background, um, you know, from marketing and advertising. Um, so to me, when she told me that, I didn't question it because, oh, of course, you know, She's doing advertising and she's creating posts. She said she was doing online sales. And I asked her, what is this? You know, she said, oh, I'm working for this lady. Never told me the name of the lady. And she was like, oh, my boss, you know, she's really nice. She's funny. She's just like you, mom. You know, she's like a really strong person. Um, You know, she's a savvy business person. And, um, you know, and I questioned her about, um, what is, was she doing? Um, she said that the woman imported handbags from China and um, it was her job to um, post, you know, the photographs and descriptions and everything for online sales. That's what she told me. Mm-hmm. And that started in the winter of 2008. So she moves in. Uh, to live with this woman, uh, it's uh, an import business for ladies' mm-hmm. hand, women's hand, handbags. And so she has this job. How often are you talking to her and where is she living? How far from you is this place where she's living then? She told me during this time that she was living in Sun City. And she told me that it was so far. And I remember saying, you know, um, you know, just for family dinners and things that we were planning up for the holidays. And when she would come home and have dinner with us, and she was like, oh, I have to go. I have to go. It's so far. It's such a long drive. So, yeah, she was coming home. And she was, um, you know, told me that she was working for this woman and living with her in Sun City. And how far is that from you again? When you were living where? Corona? Well, from Corona, from Corona to Sun City, um, it was probably a good 45 minute to an hour drive for her. Okay. And that's without traffic in California, right? So with traffic, God knows, maybe two yeah, hours drive. Could be, sure. Uh, yes, yes. So you were seeing her. She's working. You go into uh, 2009, and you not you've seen her. You're talking to her. You don't really think anything or any red flags, yellow flags going up at this time with Ashley. Now that anything at no, all? No, you know, I with Ashley. No, she's she's keeping in contact with me. She has. Um, you know, via Facebook, um, her email, and um, she had a um, pay-as-you-go phone. And, um, uh, you know, occasionally the phone would be out of service, um, but it wouldn't be that long. And it would be able you know, she'd call back, oh, sorry, my mind, you know, I had to pay this or pay that. And it was kind of normal, right? Yeah. Um, and so she tells me that um, 
she's moving to Santa Barbara. And then I, you know, I don't recall the conversation or, you know, anything of how it came about that she told me that. It, it may have been that I, you know, wanted to go there and, um, you know, see her, something like that. But she, that was just another excuse is what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so. And just so everybody knows that Sun City and Corona are nowhere near Santa Barbara. I mean, that's up the coast. I mean, that's, that's a little bit of a move. That's not moving from Riverside, you know, to, you know, to Sun City. That's moving northwest of LA, up the coast. Right. It's very far. Very and, far. Um, she told me that they were going to relocate and have a storefront now. Um, and she was going to work there as usual. She said that she would be able to go to school in Santa Barbara and everything was great. And so she moved. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we talked. And like I said, there would be times where I could not get a hold of her. Um, and she would check in and I did not at all worry that something was wrong at all. Were, I, I should ask this, were her, were her th therapy sessions over at this point? Was she required to go for a certain time or was it just at a point that you thought she doesn't have to go anymore or she didn't want to go anymore? What was the situation of that in relation to her uh, moving out of your house, moving in with Jason, then moving in for this job? What was what was the situation there? You know, um, she had stopped going to therapy, um, you know, on her own, and um, she seemed to not be, um, you know, when she came home, she seemed, uh, she seemed very fragile at the time. She was having crazy migraines, and um, you know, she was in some sort of emotional distress definitely um after she had um disappeared in las vegas and um and um you know she she uh she, she stopped going to uh, therapy and i don't know whether she continued at any other time on her own okay okay so She's up there in Santa Barbara, a long way from you now, so I, I suppose that she can't visit as much, but she did go to see her dad. And what can you tell, when did that happen and, and what all happened there? Well, um, actually, she didn't, she didn't see her dad. She wrote a letter to her dad. Mm-hmm. And um, that letter to her dad was just kind of an accusational letter, you know, like, you know, you weren't, you, you didn't do this for me and you weren't around for me and just kind of just had to get a lot of things off of her chest, she felt. Um, you know, it was kind of a heartfelt letter, but she was really angry and putting him on blast, I guess. Um, they, they had, you know, their own issues, the two of them, but um, no, um, you know, during this time I had remarried and, um, and in the two weeks that she had left Jason and come home and found this job, um, Ashley had borrowed my ex-husband's laptop and, um, she was looking for work, you know, on, on the laptop and, um, it wasn't until Ashley um, went missing that I actually was told what she was looking for and what she was doing on that laptop. He finally told you. He told you what he found. Yeah. Um, as I said, I, you know, I, that marriage wasn't um, a good one. Mm. Uh, I was married for a very short time, and um, what was she doing on his laptop? Well, she was, um, she was actually looking into being an escort. 
and she was actively she was engaged in a um, conversation, a chat online with um, an agency, and um, she had asked, you know, if um, inquired if there was security, and um, if she would, ask, I mean, very, very, you know, specific things. If yeah, we, was yeah, we're, yeah, this is a PG show, but very graphic yeah. sexual things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She, okay. She went into detail, you know, asking what she was required to do, and and I, you know, he told me this, and I did not believe what he said. At all. You thought he was lying. You thought that your ex-husband was yeah. lying. I thought he was lying. I thought he was um, trying to find a way to talk to me, you know. But and, um, right, and we have to remind the listeners. You didn't know about all that stuff that went on in Arkansas. You didn't find that out afterwards. Had you known about this, then this probably would have, you probably would have believed them. But being that you didn't know about all yeah. that stuff in Arkansas, you were inclined not to believe him. Right. Right. I mean, okay. absolutely not. You yeah, know, sure. He told me that I was just angry at him, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and I had a chance to confront her about what was said um yes yeah, well I she was let's let's set this up a little bit so she's up in santa barbara she's working for this woman this live-in situation mm -hmm. and then at some point she decides did she decide that she wanted to come stay with you for a few days or did you invite her and i guess it was it been summer of 2009 june july of 2009 mm -hmm. how did that all happen yeah it's her birthday and um, we're making and what, plans for and, her to come home. And what is her birthday? July? It's July 29th. She, uh, and I'm August 1st. She's a great Leo like I am. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. Leo. Okay. Right. okay. I'm a Leo August 1st. So, yeah. You know, we're all excited. And she, we haven't seen her for a few months. And we're excited. And, you know, she had previously told me that she had gotten a new car and she's going to drive it down from Santa Barbara, and um, she's going to spend, uh, I think it was four days with us, like the weekend plus, right? Uh, you know, Monday or something like that. Um, and so we were really excited to um, be able to celebrate her birthday with her. And so, um, you know, time draws near for her to come. And then we're talking on the phone, and I and I said to her, um, okay, so, you know, the plans, what time are you going to be here? When are you leaving? You're driving out. And she's like, oh, well, I, I don't have my car. I, something happened to my car. My car broke down. And I'm like, what? That's, what are you talking about? You just buy a new car? You, you know, what do you, what do you mean? Well, what's wrong? Are you have it in the shop? And I'm, you know, I'm a mom. I'm like, <laughs> what's going on? And, um, you know, she says, uh, you know, mom, I just, the car's not working. I'm not going to be able to drive it down. And I said, okay, that's fine. No, you know, whatever. We're going to come get you. No, she says, no, no, mom, it's okay. I know you're busy. No, she's going on and on. And, um, she's, you know, um, I, I, I mean, looking back at it now, she just didn't, she didn't want me to have, to know where she was. And, um, you know, I offered to pick her up. I said, you know, her brothers and I would go out and get her. And, nope, I really, I'm going to take the Greyhound bus. I was angry again. I was, you can't take the bus. Like, what are you talking about? Why would you take the bus? We'll come get you. Um, and she's like, no, I already bought my ticket. And, you know, mom, don't fuss over me and this and that. And at the end of the day, she showed up and um, picked her up at the bus. You know, we all went down to the Riverside. Greyhound bus station and we got her we picked her up and uh, you know we went out to dinner and you know we had birthday cake and just family time and it was just know, like old times just, just like old times yeah just family time yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like old times exactly and then it, um, it came time for her to go home and I um, asked her to say goodbye to her brothers at the house and um, and um, I wanted to have her by myself. And so when we got to the bus station, we we're talking. And I said, you know, Ashley, I go, Abe said something to me. And it's like, 
you know, like really crazy. I said, but I, I just have to ask you. I just want to know what your response is. And I told her what he said, that she borrowed his computer and he, she was looking into becoming an escort. I just asked her, I said, this is what he said, Ashley. Like, you know, come on, like that didn't happen, right? And she looked at me and it was so awkward in the car. And so, and she's like, well, well, yeah, mom, but you know, I just, I wouldn't really do something like that. And I'm just looking at her like, what? And so I, you know, I, again, I'm just shocked by this behavior. And I'm like, Ashley, you know, I, you know, you can always come home. If you were ever, if you ever needed anything, we're right here for you. You know, I mean, for you to even, even talk to somebody about this, to even, I was just so concerned about her at the time. Like, for you to even think and follow through with going online and going to an escort service and, and talking and having that conversation with somebody you know, I, I was just like, you know, God, you are just so precious. You, you know, to even think about selling your body and your, you know, I mean, what are you doing? So she I didn't mean, outright, that, I mean, she didn't try to lie her way through it. She kind of, she just admitted that, yep, I, I did it. I mean, she wasn't, yep. f- she didn't fully disclose everything, but she owned it. No. No, she, she owned up she to owned it. it. Okay. She looked, she was crying. She started crying. And I thought at the time, I thought she was crying because I told, was telling her how precious she, she is. And, you know, how much we loved her. And, you know, I, that's why I thought she was crying. And I totally believed her that she was not doing that. Yeah. And that was the last day that I saw her. That was the last day that I saw her. And that would have been late July, sometime after her birthday, uh, sometime around her birthday of July, 2009. And that was, so you drove to the bus station and, and something that you pointed out to me in specifically is you never did actually see what bus she got on that day. I didn't see. I didn't no. look up. I mean, no. I, you know, it's these things when you're, I don't know. I just didn't look up to see where is this bus going, right. you know? Right. Right. And once again, maybe you'd, you'd known some of the things that went on in Arkansas. You know, you, you, you know, you might've approached this in a little bit in different way. You might've been a lot more wary uh, than you are. Um, yeah. And I want, I need to keep reminding the listeners of that because once again, for, let's just say since she graduated high school, you personally, seems like everybody who knew her was kind of a little bit in the dark as to what was going on behind the scenes in her life. She was not telling people things and then some people yeah. were selling, seeing things and not saying anything. But you personally, well, you, you know, yeah, please. Please. No, I mean, if you knew Ashley and she said something to you like, you know, hey, I think I'll be a stripper, you would you would never think that that was like a legitimate, you know, um, desire for her to actually do this. Like she would actually do it. You, you never would think this. It's mm-hmm. just like, you know, well, okay, you'll be a stripper. I'll be the president. And it's like, you know. A, a joke. I mean, that's what Brittany told me. She was like, I go, I heard she was joking. Mm-hmm. So you see her end of July, 2009. And you, do you continue to, uh, do you talk with her on the phone? Do you email back and forth or what was the status of your communication with Ashley after you saw her that day? It was, um, I didn't hear from Ashley and, you know, we had, 
um, a couple of emails between us and um, and they just seemed to just the the time in between just got got longer and longer and she I couldn't reach her on her cell phone was out of order and um, I didn't have an address for her um, you know pretty soon <clears throat> Towards the um, latter part of 2009, her the emails that I'm sending, like, where are you? Hello, you know, we're worried about you. Um, the emails start bouncing back. And there's no address found for that. And um, Facebook is white, just gone. Like, and then the account, it's not just, just stagnant, it just disappeared. <clears throat> Gone. Every form of communication um, just gone, and none of her friends, none of her friends. She did not talk to anyone. She just vanished. And just to be clear, one uh, once again, after you saw her that day, you never did talk to her on the phone anymore. All you did was have electronic communication once again through email. Never, right. I mean, to put it bluntly, you never heard her voice again. To put it bluntly. That's right. Okay. Thank you. I didn't. Okay. So it's there's the possibility that we have to leave open that it may be in some of these emails. It might not have even been her who was responding, especially since you're saying that um, the responses, the time you talked to her got longer periods in between them. Mm -hmm. It's something we have to uh, be open to. So – um. We get to 2000, November 2009, like you said, virtually her entire footprint on the internet is either, you know, is gone or things are bouncing back. Um, what do you do? What, what, what goes on at that time? Do you, file, you filed a police report, I suppose. Well, I worry a lot yeah. and question whether she's um, angry, um, if she just doesn't want to talk to me because we've had our issues in the past. Um, it was puzzling to me because um, she, we had a, a really great time for her birthday with the family. And um, she was always close to her brothers. She was 10 years old when her baby brother was born and she was like his second mother. And she just, you know, she he was like a little doll to her at that age, and she just always wanted to feed him and dress him and rock him, and you know, um, she loves Joseph so much, and um, she would never not stay in touch with him. She was, you know, she was always very close to her baby brother. Um, so you know, October, nothing. Um, starting to get really concerned about her. Um, finally, you know, the holidays are here and um, she's, you know, we're, we're all freaking out. Like what happened? Where is she? The worst part about this is the guilt um, of, you know, I, I was just, guilt it was like regret like why didn't you why don't you have her address you know mm -hmm. to have a child out there and not know anything i could just uh, i was just so angry at myself but you have to remember something kim the reason the reason you didn't have it is because she didn't want you to have it Okay, it's not because you didn't want it. It's Definitely. because she didn't want you to have it. The reason you didn't know where she was living with this uh, woman who was her boss is because she didn't want you to know. The reason you didn't know that whether she got on a Greyhound bus to La, Qu La Quinta or up to Santa Barbara is because she didn't want you to know. You know, you know, don't. I know it. I know this is horrible, but don't. You know, blame yourself too much. This was all part of Ashley's plan. And, and the listeners will know uh, what I mean by that here in, in a moment. So I want you to understand that. Even if you'd have 
cornered her and, and all of these things, she wasn't gonna she wasn't gonna tell you. Okay, she wasn't. It's it's part of what happened to her, you know. And I've had to learn that uh, from experience myself, talking to people, you know, exactly like yourself who have lost in their lives. The reason these people don't know is because there were people who didn't want them to know. It's not because you didn't want to know. It's just you do, you weren't going to be told one way or the other. So you you file a police report. And yeah. you, they, you really obviously don't have a lot to tell the police. She's working for this woman, but you don't know this woman's name. And she's an importer of handbags, and it's allegedly in Santa Barbara. Can the police do help you in any way? Well, they started an investigation, and um, and we, uh, you know, we went to Santa Barbara. We knocked on every door. We, you know, every storefront there. Um, there wasn't any new businesses there. We went to Sun City. We put out missing, you know, uh, person flyers there, got no help. Um, during the time that um, there was the investigation, um, people started to talk. And um, I would sit with the uh, lead detective on this case and um, just, couldn't believe the things that I was hearing. Um, you know, uh, uh, it turns out that Ashley told me the truth. She definitely was working in sales and for this woman, and um, she was she was handling online sales. And it just wasn't handbags. It was actually, she was. Uh, erotic was massage, creating. erotic massage and escort work and things like that. Right. Initially, um, from the um, interview with her friend Vinny, she, she was posting profiles. Um, and, and in, you know, soliciting, uh, people to come in and, and, um, and meet these, uh, you know, into the massage parlor. It was a prostitution ring. It was a pro, it was a prostitution ring. That's right. Um, and that's how it began. She would, um, try to make fun of it. She would send, uh, Vinny. Uh, the pictures and links and say, oh, hey, check this out. And they would just laugh on the phone about, you know, the um, the things that she would say in the in the profiles online. Um, and then when it came down to um, the interviews with Brittany, um, you know, obviously this is when I found out that Ashley was um, – on drugs and addicted to drugs, which I didn't know. Going back to our earlier in our interview when you talked mm -hmm. about her going to clubs and wanting to yep. being very promiscuous down there and she had this opioid addiction and all of that stuff. This is when you found November 2009 into early 2010 is when you eventually found all this stuff out. Yeah, this is when I just, my mind was blown and, um, so she had told Brittany that she worked in the massage parlor and she was actually performing certain sex acts and um, a lot of other things. Um, and so, you know, Brittany and Vinny do know each other, but they're not friends. And they did go to the same high school, but Vinny graduated a year earlier like Ashley did. And, um, you know, they weren't friends. And so we've got one person in Arkansas and, you know, saying that she is working for this um, as an erotic masseuse for, um, they all said it was a woman. They all said that um, she was um, in Riverside somewhere. And um, and so there's another interview done um, on the, a guy, Jason, that she dated, and he had a conversation. He said that she had called him and said that she was um, doing certain things um, to the, uh, with the clients. And um, so, you know, and he's 
not connected to anyone else. So he, he doesn't know Brittany or, or Vinny. Um, and so I'm just like, I, you know, so everybody knew a little, all these Brit, Jason is the musician. Just to remind everybody that Mm -hmm. Jason was the musician. And then Brittany's in Arkansas. Vinny was in Arkansas, but then he was in Northern California. They all kind of knew bits and pieces. Ashley had been very honest with them, to be frank, about little pieces of what she was doing, but none of them ever told you. And it seems none of them, I, I guess, kind of even knew each other so they couldn't even corroborate people each other's stories to get a really accurate picture of what Ash- Ashley was doing with her life. Well, yeah, so Vinny only knew the part that um she was posting um mm. you know the uh, profiles, the online yeah. profiles to solicit for the uh you know the massage parlor. Um he knew that part. Um you know, Brittany was able to, um, you know, to uh, tell us what she, how far she claimed she had gone. And, and Jason, um, uh, you know, he was the, the second person that had the same story. They all had similar mm-hmm. stories. Mm-hmm. And then my ex-husband is, you know, the one who um, found her... Uh, messages still on his computer um you know to get involved into yeah to this kind of business yes and then you put that together with her watching that tv show the secret die of a call girl and yeah. you, it's a it's a very complete picture um but you were Brittany though after ashley left you in late july of 2009 Brittany did talk to Ashley, and in fact, she had, I guess, some chilling stories uh, that Ashley would call her. Was, um, the last one that actually spoke with Ashley, mm-hmm. and um, so during this time, Brittany would receive calls from Ashley sporadically, and they would be from different numbers. Um, Ashley would be very quiet. And would never talk about herself. She would just want to hear, you know, Brittany talk. Um, Brittany said that she would hear a man's voice and then ask the phone would go dead. No goodbye. No, you know, hey, let me, I got to go. See you later. Just click and she'd be gone. Um, Ashley had called her uh, in the middle of the night, one night, the last time that um, anybody ever heard from Ashley. This would have been approximately uh, approximately August, late August 2009, or maybe even the beginning of September, sometime like that. Um, it, uh, it's a little later than that. Um, we, you know, we're still trying to get these, um, the actual records mm-hmm. from the phone. Um, but the last time that anybody ever talked to her was she had called Brittany and she said it was in the middle of the night, early morning. And she said, I need money. I, I, you know, this is life or death. I need to have some money. And she was crying. Um, she was hysterical on the phone. She wanted Brittany's debit card. And Brittany said, I, you know, where are you? You know, I can't help you if you don't tell me where you are. And she said, I can't tell you anything right now, but please, I need your help. It's life or death. And Brittany got angry with her. And she said, you know what, Ashley, when you can tell me where you are, then I'll help you. And she hung up on her. And, um, you know, we don't, we don't know. We don't know Mm -hmm. at that point where she was or, you know, what happened to her. I need to ask you a very blunt question uh, right now, and I'm sure the listeners are probably asking this, wondering this question as well. Why do you think Brittany never told you about any of this? During that conversation, she said to Ashley, why are you asking me for money? Why don't you call your mom? You know, Mm. and she's like, no, I can't call my mom. I don't know why Brittany didn't call me. I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't think that 
um, I think Brittany and Ashley were um, kind of having, you know, they had kind of fallen out when she left. Arkansas because Brittany was disgusted with what Ashley was doing. She was really not happy to see her friend act that way. Um, and Brittany was getting ready to, she was engaged and Ashley was going to be her maid of honor. Um, and Ashley was just kind of just, she wasn't available. She was just gone. And um, Brittany was angry with her. And I think Brittany just kind of wrote her off and just was just really angry with Ashley. Mm-hmm. And I also believe that Brittany dealt with her drug addiction. I never dealt with her drug addiction, but I have um, had people around that have had an addiction and how frustrating it is to try to help somebody and they keep going back and falling off the wagon and they keep, you know, using. Um, at some point, you just say, you know, I can't help you. you there's nothing more I can do. And um, I think that's kind of where Brittany was at the time with Ashley. When do you when do you think this? Uh, it seems that some at some point after, possibly after she graduated high school and before she went to Arkansas, which not is not a large span of time, is the time that she developed this this drug addiction to uh, just in the general category of opioids can you look back at that time now and you know put a finger on what what might have happened then did was she uh, you told me she had migraines is it possible this was a prescription that just blew out of control as so many millions of americans are experienced now we have a huge opioid addiction in the united states would you portray it that way yeah i mean she had she had, um, she had filled the prescriptions. Um, I just can't recall what it was, but it was definitely a pain for pain. Um, she was having really bad migraines. The doctor told her that she had to be like, you know, in a room, no lights with, uh, with a heating pad over her, her head and her eyes. Um, because she would vomit. She would get, the pain was so bad. Um, and, you know, I I definitely saw a change in her behavior when she started dating Carlo. Um, I, I don't know if she started doing drugs at that time. I just saw a difference in how she treated our family, how disrespectful she was, not only to us, but herself, and the way she carried herself, the way she was dressing, um, and she just wanted to live in the dark and she just didn't want to, um, you know, be accountable for what she was doing. And, and I I don't know if that's where it really started. Um, but definitely I, I agree with what you're saying is that it was a very short time, um, from the time that she got to Arkansas. Um, and, you know, got back here uh and her disappearance um it, it's not long i mean all of this happened so quick when you Very you fast. know when you look back at it 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 just all was towards the last couple of years um from the time that we saw her it was all compacted into like 3 years you know yeah she graduated high school in may of 2007 8 months later or, or something like that she goes uh, to Arkansas, and already she has some sort of opioid addiction. She's gone from a, like a maybe very active girl, maybe even a little tomboyish. Uh, that would be my words, yep. maybe um, a word. Yep. She goes from that to wanting to go to clubs, wearing you know uh, sexual clothes, sexually provocative clothes, wanting to meet guys. Uh, has this addiction, and to the point where a friend of hers, Brittany, can't even get her away from this. She is, you know, you know, that happened very quickly. And then she comes back to California and then she goes even a step further. She starts working for a woman who is essentially a madam who runs a prostitution ring. Very, very quick, very fast. Yeah, very fast. And I, you know, I, I feel like now that I've, you know, been able to put this puzzle together, I could see the progression from, you know, Ashley 
going and being a personal assistant and maybe she is, uh, you know, making profiles and it's not really real to her at that point. It's, you know, it's okay, you know, picture and write them. She was an excellent writer. Um, and, you know, and, you know, you do something, you're exposed to it and pretty soon it's just, it's not shocking anymore. And, you know, these girls get desensitized to, you know, this whole underground, you know, prostitution world. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's human trafficking, right? It's, yes, it's like, it is, it be, it be, it, 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 it's normalizing this abnormal behavior and they're just, you know, she's around other girls that are prostitutes and they're, they're young like her and they're doing it too. Yeah. It's like the new normal. It's, she's around people who are doing women, young women who are doing the same thing as she is. So it doesn't seem like there's anything unusual about it. Right. Now, you did know, find out, though, of a woman who was very familiar with this madam, although we're still not sure her name, what her name is, but we're going to get into that in a moment, who kind of knew what was going on in Riverside. What, what did this woman who you got to know uh, tell you? Her, her daughter almost got wrapped up in this. That's right. Um, so I had a hairdresser, and um, she did – um, hair extensions and she was she was known for the type of hair extensions that she did and she had clientele a um, large percentage that were actually um, dancers strippers um, and um, so her her daughter is the same age as Ashley her name is Taylor and um, she saw the exact same ad um, on Craigslist and it was for a personal assistant and, you know, with a lot of dollar signs and traveling and this, that, the other thing. And Taylor almost, uh, you know, she brought the ad to her mom and her, her mother, because of the clients that she had, had an awareness of this madam that ran this prostitution ring in Riverside County. Um, and she was like, you yeah, know, <laughs> you know, that's don't call that number. That's this woman. And so, you know, thank God she was able to, um, you know, intervene in, um, Taylor didn't get involved Mm -hmm. in anything like that. But, um, I, I, I feel like, you know, that definitely is the same person that posted that ad. Yeah. And even though this woman, we're not going to use her name, um, but she, she also though, did not know what this woman's name was that was running this ring right there in kind of the same city in California. She just knew about it. She did not know the name. Right. Yeah, she just knew she about it. The name of the person. Okay. Mm-hmm. She knew about it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now to move on and let me just some things, um, that, uh, of course the police, don't have much to go on. They talk to some of Ashley's friends, and of course, you find out all this information. But then in April of 2010, Carlo kind of pops back up. What what happened there? Oh, he, um, I got a call from the police. Um, it was from a different uh, district, and um, they asked me if and he had my phone number, so um, they asked me. Um, if I could, if I knew who he was, because they thought he was, um, you know, prowling around the area in Corona because he kept driving around and around, looked like driving really slow past um, the houses, trying to remember which house um, was ours. And um, and you didn't live in that neighborhood know, anymore, and he didn't know that. Right. We right we had mm-hmm. moved, and at the time we were living in San Diego. And so, um, yeah, they, you know, um, I, I, they picked him up and he was later released, but he said he was looking for Ashley. He, you know, remembered, you know, the neighborhood she lived in and he was desperately trying to find her. And so he was driving around looking for her. Kind of a strange story, you know, and this would have approximately been, 
uh, eight months after you saw her the last time and approximately mm-hmm. five months after you filed the pl- first police report. And then all of a sudden, a little while later, he's driving around your no- old neighborhood. The police find him and he obviously did not know that uh, you had moved. And I'm guessing, even though you thought that he was a bad influence on her at the time, uh, do you get the feeling that he had no idea either that what she got wrapped up in? What do you think? In fact, you had a chance to talk I, to him if you want to talk about that. I, yeah. So we started a, my uh, good friend Robin started a Facebook um, community page for Ashley where, you know, people can post, you know, notes or any tips and things like that. And, um, and so he recently within the last you know six months had posted on the Facebook he put a picture of um, the two of them together and I think it was um, maybe it might have been you know around uh, maybe a prom picture and um, and so we had a chance to have a long chat on Facebook and he had no awareness that she was um, missing for all this time and uh, he lives out of the country now but um you know he was just kind of torn up about everything you know so i i i honestly don't i don't think that he does but you know with with all this that has happened i i mean i can believe anything these days right it's like yeah yeah sure but being that he was looking for her in your old neighborhood, especially, let's just say, an average of six to seven months after anybody talked to her, it would lead you to believe that he had no idea. Just was, I mean, right. He was telling the truth that never saw any flyers about her missing, never saw any news reports about her missing, didn't see anything online. And he was just looking for an old girlfriend. Maybe he was a little, you know, right. you know he's just maybe looking to rekindle a relationship or something and then finds out that she disappeared. It's possible, possible. Okay. Now, also, Ashley's name has popped up in a couple other states. Uh, what can you tell the listeners about that? And this might go into the sex trafficking, human trafficking angle. Right. So, um, you know, it's been over eight years now. And, um, you know, we, we um, have an annual briefing, I guess, um, with the detectives. And that's when we're updated on any, you know, anything that they've come across. And, um, you know, for example, we, we were waiting for her license to expire, her driver's license to expire. And it, it, the date came and it went and she never renewed her license. And every year they check and to date, she's never renewed her driver's license. Um, um, so the one thing is, uh, twice they told me that her name had come up and and Ashley Kohler, same, you know, Ashley Victoria Kohler, same birthday had come up, um, that her name was run in one time in New Mexico. Um, but there was nothing, there were no records. So she Somebody could have had, you know, given a name. We don't know the circumstances, but, um, you know, for sure one time in New Mexico, they have that record. And they thought that one time in Florida, um, they had mentioned to me, they, you know, they said, you know, we believe that her name was run again um, in Florida over the last uh, couple of years. All right. So maybe it was her. Ashley is a fairly common first name, especially these days, especially around girls Ashley's age. Kohler, not Mm -hmm. the most common last name, but there are many Kohlers, K-O-L-L-E-R, in the United States. So could be a a totally different girl. Could be. We just we just we just aren't sure. But there is the possibility that, you know, maybe it was her. We just don't know. Um, and something I don't have in my, in my notes, but I feel like I have to ask you about this is that I, I saw that on her Charlie Project profile, 
that sometimes she might have gone by a different name and her middle middle name was Victoria. Uh, what can you what can you tell talk, can you talk about that? Um, you know, during the um, investigation, and um, you know, they the uh, detectives asked, you know, could she have another alias? Um, and she definitely, um, you know, she's told me that she wanted to change her last name. She actually asked me if I would assist her um, with having her name, her last name, legally changed. She didn't like her last name, and a lot of it is because of her bad relationship with her father. Um, and she wanted to use the last name Lawson, and that was her grandmother's um, maiden name, Lawson. And um, so I, you know, if there was um, her choice, I believe that she would drop the name um, Kohler and go with Ashley Lawson or Victoria Lawson. So there's the possibility that maybe she didn't renew her driver's license under Ashley Kohler. Maybe she went and got a new identity with Victoria Lawson or a, vari or a variation on that. Vicky Lawson, let's say. Right. Right. So it's possible. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Okay. I, so I, I mean, the, there is there would have to still be a link between – her, you know, driver's license and fingerprints, you know, even if your name changes, they could still match you up, right? And they could, but in the in the line of uh, work that she had gotten into, um there's a lot of ID theft and forging of documents and all sorts of things that go on. For sure. You know, so um and there's a very well-known case from this past year where a woman successfully lived under another woman's name for 30 years, you know, stole a baby's name who had died in California, I believe it was, and she moved to Texas. And not even her husband knew until she died that she had been somebody else. She was pretending to be somebody else all the time. So, wow. um, but in sex trafficking, human trafficking rings, ID theft, I've covered some cases on Unfound where uh, people who have disappeared – their IDs were, were eventually stolen. So it does happen. That's why I thought I needed to bring that up, just in case uh, anything like that you know, popped up. Now, the listeners should know that um, while the first conversation that Kim and I had, there was something that, that was in the back of my mind. I don't even know why I even knew about it. I, I, to this day, I have no idea. But being that the... This about this prostitution ring in Riverside, California. I re, I had told Kim during our conversation. I think close to the end of the conversation, I said, "Man, that really." There's something about that that just really. I read something, a story about that recently, and I really that's all I could really tell her. And while we were on the f phone, you actually got on the computer and found exactly what I was talking about. Um, you discovered that there was a prostitution ring in Riverside that was broken up in 2015. Um, yeah. And so who is May Wang? M-E-I is the first name. name W-A-N-G is the last name. What can you tell the listeners about her? Well, she is a madam um, who has, um, you know, been caught for um, human trafficking. She ran several brothels in uh, throughout the Riverside County um, from the years 2009 and um, up until she was arrested um, a couple of years ago. Um, you know, she would solicit her uh, clients online with um, these profiles and. Um, she is, I guess, awaiting sentence in uh, December or January coming up. Um, she may be serving six years in prison for um, her crimes. And this was not something that you had ever heard about until it kind of just in passing, it even jumped into my head. You'd not known about this. No, I no. Mm, okay. I mean, I don't. You know, the one thing about um, 
missing persons case and why I appreciate what you're doing so much um, is that initially they go out and they, you know, they get whatever leads and, and um, the, you know, after that, after the, basically the low hanging fruit, um, they really don't do much after that. No, they and, don't. Um, no. Yeah. And, and after you had mentioned it and we did find that um, story about her, um, you, you know, encouraged me to go and talk to uh, the lead detective and um, trying to get in touch with him. They, the department wouldn't even, Oh, are you, do you know him? You know, I'm like, what is this? This is, yeah. You know, I tried to tell them, I said, you know, my daughter's been missing and I think that this woman had something to do with it. I mean, I, if she's in, you know, prison right now, can somebody, you know, I just want somebody to interview her and, you know, and find out. And that's, um, yeah, very, very frustrating. It is. Very frustrating. But this May Wang certainly fits the profile. We Once again, we sure. you never knew it. Nobody ever knew who, you know, of course, Ashley never told you, never told her name, even under the guise of selling imported handbags. You never knew the name, but this woman certainly fits the profile of the kind of person that Ashley would have been working for. Yeah. Same city, same business. And what's most important about this is not, to my knowledge, I couldn't find anything. She never was in Santa Barbara. This May Wang operated out was. operated out yeah. of the Riverside. Is it La Quinta? Not La Quinta. La Quinta uh, area of California, which is nowhere near Santa Barbara. So that goes back to what Ashley said. Oh, we're moving to Santa Barbara. I think we're maybe thinking now that that never happened. I yeah, I agree. I I I, I don't believe that they did move to Santa Barbara. I think she stayed out in the Sun City um, area in Riverside County, and maybe they moved her around. Um, I do know, you know, in talking to the detective, um, they were aware of prostitution rings in the area. Um, and the very first time that they had, you know, told me that they were concerned that she may be involved in human trafficking. Um, and they were, you know, telling me that they do move the girls around and, you know, it, and, you know, the girls, a lot of them stay um, on drugs. They keep them on drugs and um, so they, you know, can get them, you know, they have control over them. You know, and I, I, I just remember just arguing and crying and just saying, you know, you, you know, you don't understand my daughter doesn't do drugs. She's not a drug addict. She's not one of those girls. And, um, and it's just so so hard to to understand how this happened. You know, I I mean, yeah. you know, my daughter's gone, and she's involved in something like this. Completely wiped her existence, wiped from you know away, and um, these people. They know exactly, you know, they're, they, they, they're predators. They are. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. They, they can spot the weaknesses yeah. in people very quickly, mm -hmm. especially younger women, especially. Mm -hmm. yes. Whether the, uh, the, the weakness is the girls need for love or the girls need for drugs or whatever it is, they clothes, shoes, whatever it may be, they will find that weakness and they will exploit it. They are masters at that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say to um, – I mean, I know that I have a lot of uh, mothers and daughters who are listeners. What would you say to them out there? You know, if a mother suspects, you know, here's this story and says, you know what? I caught my daughter watching that same TV show, or I caught my daughter – reading about something online regarding escort services and things. What would, what would you say to uh, uh, parents like that, that, you know, any recommendations, you know, any suggestions? I, 
the, the whole the whole thing that's shocking is that we we are not from that world and um I mean you just it's like the farthest thing ever that you can even conceive to be a concern. Um you know, it, it just I mean, you just would never think that. You, you you watch a movie and, you know, somebody gets angry and they get a gun and they shoot somebody. You don't think, oh, my God, you know, my, my son's going to get angry and shoot some. You just don't think that way. And, um, I mean, the, there's the signs are there. If you feel something, do you feel anything, you know, your, your gut. Like, I felt like, that's kind of weird. Like, I just say things to myself like, well, oh, it's a little weird that she's doing that, you know? A little concerned about that. Be very concerned about it. I mean, if you have that feeling, that intuition, that, you know, that gut feeling, I, I say you have to act on it. You really do. And, and on, just on, to never think that your child is above lying to you. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And... Even if they are 18 of adult age, which is considered to be adult age in the United States, that you should know where your kid is working and maybe know who their boss is and get an address and an email and a physical location and yeah. and, and things like that. And if it looks like they're coming into maybe some money that they don't, you know, doesn't look like they would be earning in a regular job, um, you know, you should be concerned, even, no matter what age they are, 18, 21, 25, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Any, I mean, the, just the change, the, the change, you basically have a certain disposition when you're, you know, you're hardwired to be a certain way. And, and then of course, you know, the way you're raised and everything you're exposed to definitely influences you as a person, um, you know, to, to completely turn around from that, um, there's something going on, something really wrong, really wrong. I have to tell you, I, I'm inclined to believe be being that it seems that this addiction to opioids started before she got the job, I'm just wondering if she thought that she needed to go in that direction because it's quick money, and she probably maybe she figured she couldn't, you know, feed her addiction with a regular job, so she needed to to do something like what she did. I can't help but think that. And then, of course, it was exacerbated because then those types of people are going to see that and take advantage of it as well. It's something that's in my head. I'm just wondering if the opioid addiction led to, you know, to what she chose to do. It's something I'm, um, I'm going to think about. Um... What's it been like? I know this is a very obvious question, but what's it been like the last eight years, Kim? You know, the, the hardest part about dealing with a child that's missing is the not knowing. Not knowing if she's alive, if she's being hurt if she's, you know, if, if you just want to protect your children, and it's it, it, it's just like nothing is the same for our family. Nothing, because we don't know where she is. And, um, you know, there are families that, you know, lose their children and um, their loved one, and you do have to deal with that loss. But the loss of a 
of a child because they're missing in the unknown, especially with the information that we have today, the way she, her existence was wiped clean and, you know, all the other facts that we've learned. Um, it makes it tougher. It does because you just, you know, it's, I, I just start spinning. I don't, I, I just, would, I just can't even stand to think of the kind of position that she's in today. And I know that she, she needs help. I know that she's gone because she is unable to reach out to us. She's being prevented from getting help. She's prevented from calling us. Um, and I, I know that she's not gone because she wants to be gone. Maybe that stupid show, you know, when she first thought of doing this, it was Hollywood to her. And certainly that Diary of a Call Girl series totally glamorized being, you know, a call girl. It glamorizes that something though, in which there's no glamour to it at all. It's just dirty exactly. and it hurts a lot of people. Dirty. It hurts a lot of people. Yes. I mean, she's just being raped and fed drugs and God knows, you know, I, um, I just keep praying for her and, um, I, I, you know, just through your contact and, um, and Emily just want to thank the two of you because, um, Nobody else is going to look for her. The, definitely the, you know, law enforcement agencies, their caseload is, is, is tremendous. And she's, you know, forgotten. She's a case file. She's not a priority to them. Mm -hmm. And um, she's just a name on a page. That's it. Yeah, and then they go and do their job, and um, and nobody is going to continue to to search for her. Nobody will. So, you know, you're asking what advice what I have to say to other moms out there, other parents out there, and you know that's that's my next um, you know offer of advice is is. You you have to get out there and and continue to turn over every stone and keep looking. You have a Facebook page for Ashley, don't you? We do, yes. It's, and I'm um, going to make sure that everybody knows about it. By the time the people hearing this, I'm going to be making sure everybody knows about it and they go there and and uh you know spread the word around what's it what is the name of it um it's ashley kohler um missing since 2009 that's her facebook page okay i'm gonna make sure that everybody goes there and uh as all the listeners know i do uh quite a bit, a bit of publicity uh during the week to make sure everybody knows what we're going to be talking about who it is where people should be going what they should be talking about regarding the case that comes out every Friday. So, but it, like I said, by the time uh, they're hearing you talk to me, they've already done quite a bit of reading uh, about your daughter, Ashley. Uh, any last words, Kim? Well, you know, um, what, I, what I can say is that, um, you know, some of the preliminary reports, um, you know, they are not accurate because, as I said, it took this investigation um, for us to know what really happened to Ashley. And when we first, when the, um, you know, the Corona Police Department first released the um, missing persons report, I mean, we had no idea. 
absolutely not. So, um, you know, it, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, look at all of those dates on there. Um, yes. you know, uh, if you have any information, uh, obviously our phone numbers are there. Um, you know, you can call us directly or, um, the lead detective phone numbers on there. Um, you know, any, any help, any, anything is welcome. And we, we will continue to, um, you know, search for Ashley. We know that, um, we know we're, we know we're going to see her again. We do. We know we'll see her again. And Kim, I'm going to do everything I can. You're right that there are a lot of dates and, and some things that aren't right concerning Ashley's disappearance. And I'll, I'll do what I can to get those um, those inf that information changed because the most important part is, you know, getting the information right. It's very important. And right. um, I deeply appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing to help these missing women, you know, to keep the light shining on them. And I just pray for every family out there to, you know, continue to have faith and be strong and pray that you are reunited with your, your loved ones. Kim, thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Kim Brandy, mother of Ashley Kohler. I thank her for being on the program. I also need to thank Emily, my de facto assistant, who put me in contact with Kim. Emily has done outstanding work for Unfound this year. As I stated at the beginning of this episode, it's difficult to find out after the fact that something is or isn't true. And for Kim or any parent, this kind of situation is the worst of all worlds. You already have a disappearance where there are no answers. But on top of that, Kim doesn't have any answers as to why Ashley took such a drastic turn in the first place. To reiterate, in the span of about three months, Ashley went from having a great relationship with her mother to vanishing on a trip to Las Vegas to celebrate her 18th birthday. Three months. That's all it took. I'm reminded of the case of Jessie Foster. She went from Canadian country girl to convicted prostitute with a broken jaw within about the same amount of time. This also happening in Las Vegas, coincidentally. However, the key to this case is in California, and it stems from what was explained in the episode. For some reason, I remember reading about a madam in Riverside, California. This could be six months ago, a year ago, I really don't remember. I have no idea why I even came across the story. But that memory was just kind of floating around up there in my brain, and I passed it along to Kim during our first conversation. And then it was Kim who tracked down the woman's name and her various crimes. She had not heard of the story before we talked. I believe this is the same woman Ashley was an assistant to. Riverside police now have to do their job to ask Ms. Wang what she knows about Ashley Kohler, because I believe she knows a lot. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you used to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.